we still tweak because we don't always know what's going to work and what's not. We just know that God co-labors with us. We don't hold everything so tightly as to say God has divinely inspired this exact thing. No, it's, it's God keeps walking with us where we go and we have to keep seeking it out and figuring it out. So last week we talked about uh, the intersection between religion and politics, everybody's favorite uh, church kind of topics. And we talked a lot about how uh, the prophets throughout the Bible, really much of their job was to engage with politics. Um, they, they were the ones that kind of corrected governments and try to bring them into alignment with the kind of things that God cares about because God is a God of justice. That being said, there are always ways in which we want to engage our world on behalf of God, and that takes a lot of wisdom and discernment. Uh, somebody was very influenced. Uh, um, they felt just a, a whisper from the Spirit on their heart. Alyssa uh, gave me a bunch of documents about some of the ways in which we can step into global politics, into the global sphere. Obviously, there's a lot going on um, around the world right now, especially between Israel and Palestine. And what she put together for me was a list of ways in which you can engage to try to bring about peace. There are people getting hurt. There are people dying. Uh, many uh, women and children and civilians, people who are not engaged in the war, are getting killed as well. So these are ways in which you can participate with active different kinds of of nonprofits that are getting into those spaces to serve people, love people, and bring about peace. Uh, those are sometimes the kinds of things that we do in the midst of those situations as we, we cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, which is peace. We also engage in the, the pain that's left behind by these kinds of things. So I will be sending out an email with some of those different resources. We'll also get some printed off for next week so that you can grab those on the way out. If you're looking for a way to, to engage in those kinds of conversations and just love people in the midst of their pain and hurt, because I know that feels a world away, because for us, it is a world away. Many of us are not going to be able to fly over there, but there may be somewhere that you can put your money toward um, to love those who are getting hurt on all sides. Okay, with that being said, we're going to hop into today's message, which finds us in numbers. Going old school right here. If you're familiar with the story, it goes like this. God's people are slaves in the land of Egypt, and God has had enough of it. They have been abused, they've been persecuted, and so God, in a way, steps into politics and then frees uh, Israel from their governmental oppressors. They are pulled out of slavery, and God then turns them into his own nation, whom he is now going to pour into and love and guide and lead. And one of the ways in which he guides and leads is curious to us, because we haven't seen this quite happen in, in today's time, but there's a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. And this is God's presence with them. This is God being made manifest in their own world, that they can look at that pillar of fire, they can look at that cloud, and they can follow it because God is guiding them through this wilderness that they otherwise don't know their way around. And so it's interesting. If we go to Numbers 9, we see exactly how this dynamic works. It's, it's very specific. Check this out. On the day the tabernacle was set up, so this is the place that God is dwelling in, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of testimony, and at evening it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, after that the people of Israel set out. And the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out, and at the command of the Lord, they camped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle many days, the people of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle, and according to the command of the Lord, they remained in camp. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. And sometimes the Lord remained from evening until morning. And when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. Or it continued day and night. When the cloud lifted, 
they set out. I, I kind of get the gist here. There's a lot of repetition. It's kind of old school Hebrew for you. Because in a, a culture that did not have things that they could read all the time, they had to learn by listening. So if you ever wonder why the Bible says the same thing over and over again, when you say it over and over again, people start to get it caught up in their psyche, right? That's how an oral culture used to, to learn, by hearing things musically like that. Okay, now with that being said, we have this paradigm. Israel goes where God goes. If the pillar moves, they move. If the cloud moves, they move. If it doesn't move, even if it's been many days, even if it's been morning all the way until evening, if it doesn't move, they don't move. Right? Everybody, everybody's got the paradigm? This is, this is the classic Christian paradigm that we sing so many worship songs about. God, I will follow you wherever you want to take me, lead me. I just want to be completely sold out for you. Empty me of all myself and just let it be all about you. But there's something interesting that happens in the next chapter with no explanation whatsoever. We have very little pretext. First, we go through one of those really boring genealogies where you just read like 100 people's names. You know what I'm talking about? Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about because you always skip it when that happens. I get it. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie, for your honesty. <laughs> All right. Here's a strange passage after your stories of rules and legalities and people and their families. This story shows up. And Hob, sorry, not Hobab, sorry, Moses said to Hobab, the son of Reuel the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us, and we will do good to you, for the Lord has promised good to Israel. But he said to him, I will not go. I will depart to my own land and go to my kindred. And he said, please do not leave us. For you know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you will serve as eyes for us. And if you do go with us, whatever good the Lord will do to us, the same we will do to you. So they set out from the mount of the Lord, three days' journey. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them, three days' journey, to seek out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day whenever they set out from the camp. Whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. What was that? Like, what do you do with that weird little story that we don't usually have show up in our messages because it's so random, so short? But we just saw the dynamic of how this worked in Numbers 9. God shows up, he moves, you move. He doesn't move, you don't move either. And then we move to Numbers 10, and Moses is specifically trying to, to bring in a guy who knows the wilderness to send him out to figure out where they should go next. What's that all about? Don't we just follow the cloud? And even stranger, they take the Ark of the Covenant with them, which is supposed to be the seat upon which God sits. That's what kings did in the ancient world. Remember Aladdin, Prince Ali is on that thing that they're moving. That's what the Ark of the Covenant is. God is sitting on top of it. He's not inside of it. And as they move into the wilderness, three days journey to just kind of seek out ahead and take God with them, what happens? The cloud follows them. So which one is it? What is the dynamic by which we are supposed to live? Is it we wait for God to move and then we follow God? Or is it, is it possible sometimes that God is waiting for us to move and we follow God as he goes with us? What is the lesson to be learned here? Is, is Moses being disobedient? Does he not have enough faith to trust that the cloud's going to move at some point? Does he not trust that God's going to lead him to a safe place? Or... Has Moses been given some other instructions? God saying, let's go together. Or is Moses just going and praying that God comes with him and God does? What's the dynamic? I don't know. And a lot of commentaries will go in a lot of different directions. So I'll preach it in the direction that I have sensed in my own life, is that God co-labors with us. 
God co-labors with us. He partners with us to do the kinds of things that he wants to do. I don't necessarily feel a glimpse of, of, there's no like specific word here that seems to say that Moses is sinning by what he's doing. The fact that God goes with him seems to imply that, that he carries God's favor in some way. But I think this is a great example of the dynamic that all Christians find themselves in. We just came and partook of the body and blood of Jesus. Saying, Jesus, when we get lost, we need a sign. Jesus, we need direction. And one of the beautiful lines in the liturgy that we read today was, I recognize that there are sometimes many good ways to go. But Jesus, if you care about the goodest way... (laughs) the best way, then would you lead me toward that? That's your frozen theology. Do the next right thing, right? Like sometimes you got to just figure out what the next right thing is if you don't feel any other impulse of which ways to go. And that is actually the way in which God seems to work in the Bible, both in the heavenly realm and in the earthly realm. There are stories of where God gathers his council of spiritual beings in the heavens and says, all right, I've made this judgment. I want your input, angels. How are we going to pull this off? And the angels will then offer ideas, and then God will hear them out. And then sometimes he'll select some of their ideas. Uh, There's a prophet that sees this happen in 1 Kings 22, I think it was. And then you also have angels that show up to Nebuchadnezzar and say, we have this decree for you. That's our decree. The angels have chosen this. So you see ways in which spiritual beings are collaborating with God to bring about God's will in the heavenlies and on the earth. That is the same way in which God works with you. And this is why I don't particularly love the theology that tries to empty us of ourselves, that tries to say that, God, all of you and none of me, no Jamin left. Just pour me out completely so it's just you in here. That's not the dynamic God designed it. It's not the one that he wants. If he wanted that, he would just made a bunch of Jesuses. <laughs> Instead, he wanted to make you, specifically you, just as you are, and then show you what it looks like to be fully human, which is Jesus, so that you have a pattern to copy, you have someone to look up to and say, what he did is what I want to do. And then give you the Holy Spirit to infuse you with the power that you need to do the kinds of things that he cares about. And from there, it is your job to co-labor with him. So when I do a lot of inner healing with people, we do a lot of spiritual meditation where I give them the space to just listen carefully to the Holy Spirit And there's often times where you can just sense that the Holy Spirit's at work. And it takes discernment, of course, to figure out what's the Holy Spirit and what's our own thoughts and things like that. But that's part of the reason that we have more than just one person in the room is we're discerning it. So I had a friend one time who who was given an opportunity to go take a job in another state. And so they were sitting there and they said, what do you think God wants me to do? And I was like, well, let's ask. Let's have you close your eyes and... Uh, let's go to Jesus and ask the Holy Spirit what he wants. And as they paused and they closed their eyes and, and they waited, they had this vision, this vision of Jesus. Jesus, what should I do? Should I move away and take this job or should I stay right here? And you know what vision they saw of Jesus? That wasn't me shrugging. That was Jesus shrugging. Like, what do you want to do? Now, most of us, and this is especially true with pastors because we're always like, I've been called to this area right here. That's why I took this job in A, B, C, or D. I wouldn't have left if I wasn't called there. Most of us have this feeling like I only get up and move from the position I'm in if God calls me to it. And yet, here's Jesus with somebody in ministry. Am I supposed to go there or stay here? And Jesus is like, where do you want to go? The mission's the same regardless. Of course, there are specific circumstances that God calls us to. You can, you can see that a hundred times over. You can read through the Bible and you see people called to specific places. But there's also just this generalness to our mission. 
whether you're in Jackson or Colorado, that's not a city. I tried to grab a city. Denver. Whether you're in Jackson or Denver, the mission is the same. In Denver as it is in heaven. In Jackson as it is in heaven. Live like Jesus in Denver or Jackson. Serve the people of Denver or Jackson. God can specifically call you to places, but even when he doesn't, even when it's a shrug, the answer is still the same. He goes with you nonetheless. There's so many ways in which God wants to partner with you. He could do it all himself, but that's not the framework of the dynamic that he set up for our world. I remember there was one time I was trying to kick out a legion of demons in someone. We had so many to deal with. It had been months and months on end of trying to get them out, but too much inner healing was needed. And there was one night where it had just got so intense, the person could not see straight anymore. They could not think straight anymore. And I was at my wit's end, and I had them go to Jesus and say, Jesus, what are we supposed to do? And the Holy Spirit was so clear, and it was, it was a bizarre situation that I've only experienced a few times. But the Holy Spirit was so clear and just said, Jamin, you and me kick them out tonight with force. And I knew we hadn't finished the inner healing, so I knew that they would get back because the Bible says that they always try to get back. And if you don't deal with the inner healing, the door is wide open for them to get back. But after months of trying, we hit a wall in which the Holy Spirit was clear, Jamin, and you and me kick them out with force. I had permission and that was the strangest statement to me because I was like, why, why, why me? <laughs> why the partnership? God, you can just kick them out. You could just do it. Why does Jamin need to partner with you to do that? And the answer is, I have no idea. Except for this understanding that we co-labor with God. That in the same way he works with the spiritual beings of heaven and the angels of heaven, so he works with the human beings of earth to bring about his will. Jamin, you and me kick them out. And so after months and months of trying to kick out a legion of demons, I took authority and I said, in the name of Jesus, you all have to go. And they saw them all leave. All of them. The whole, whole legion, the whole army. Now, I had said those words a million times before, but it wasn't time. On this particular time, on this particular night, Jesus wanted to co-labor with me to finally bring it about. Temporarily, the person had to get their mind back, and then we had to face it again. And that's exactly what happened. I knew they'd be back. They came back, and then we continued to fight and continued to win because the Spirit co-labored with us. But all throughout our journeys, that's the general way in which God works. When I look at this church, that's the general way in which we've worked. When we started a dinner church, God never said start a dinner church. But he did say to go with faith and slay some giants. He gave me a word uh, when it really felt like we were going to fall apart. He gave me a word that, Jamin, you need to be like Caleb in the Bible. And gave this to me through another pastor. And uh, you need to be like Caleb in the Bible and have the faith of Caleb. Caleb had to go up against giants and believe that they could overcome it. At the time, our church was in a lot of difficulty in moving forward. And we're like, how, how are we going to do that? I don't know. All I know is that I have to go with faith and trust that God will follow. And we started a dinner church. And we finally hit triple digits. And we started uh, seeing all the fruit that we had been longing for for so long. Because God co-labored with us. But he never said, do a dinner church. Now you're here today, obviously, it's not a dinner church because COVID got in the way of that. But the, the model that you're in right now was a different co-labership. I had a dream one night, and God was just kind of, uh, it was a very kind of surreal dream, just showing me an image of two slides. There was a straight, boring one in gray, and then a really exciting, colorful one that went all over the place. And I just felt the Spirit saying in the dream, take the exciting one. And so what we created was this three-hour service. He didn't say make a cereal bar. He didn't say create a ministry hour. And for that reason, we still tweak. Because we don't always know what's going to work and what's not. We just know that God co-labors with us. 
We don't hold everything so tightly as to say God has divinely inspired this exact thing. No, it's, it's God keeps walking with us where we go and we have to keep seeking it out and figuring it out. That is the way in which life goes. So next time you go to pray that prayer, God, none of me, all of you, empty me out. Stop yourself in the midst of it and realize God doesn't want that or he would have designed the world that way. He wants you, specifically you, infused with this spirit to do the kinds of things that he wants. And sometimes you're going to feel this real intense uh, presence of God come on something and you're going to know like I am in the right stream right now. This is exactly what he wants me to do. And other times you're going to have no idea. You're going to have no idea and you're just going to hope that what you're doing is right. You're going to lead into those parables about how how I'm planting seed and I hope it springs up, but I have no idea. Sometimes you know and sometimes you don't. But you still do the best next right thing. You, you still try to find the good path forward. It's not all set in place. You're going to make choices. It's another inner healing moment somebody had as I was leading them through uh, another time with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave them several different paths they could go. And then they felt this whispered to them, these are the paths I have ordained for you, which will really mess with your free will predestination theology. (laughs) These are the free will choices that I have preordained and put in place for you. (laughs) What? What? But it made so much sense, though. These are the paths I know you're going to walk. Choose the right one. But which one's the right one? I don't know. Maybe all of them were. And as we kept pushing forward, they were shown new paths. Okay, you've now taken this one. Here's this new set of paths we're going to take. And our prayer in that season just every time was, okay, God, which one is the best? What is the best path that we can walk because we don't know which one brings about the most ultimate good? Even if several of these are good, even if several of these are the best, which one would you choose? And it may be possible that he speaks back in those situations to say, no, you choose. Which one's the best for you? You are not small and nothing to God. Two trillion galaxies in the cosmos, and he knows you by name. You are not little. You are not dirty. You are not a worm. You are not all the different kinds of things religion has chucked at you to make you feel less than. You are a child of God. And the children of God are welcome before his throne to make judgment calls with him. And one day, Paul says, you will judge angels. You, Christians, do you know who you are? You are not nothing. You are the the people that, that bring this world into the cultivation of heaven. If Jackson is going to experience heaven at all, it's going to be through the Christians that live there. If Jackson is going to see the expansion of the kingdom of heaven, it's going to be through you showing others who Jesus is. It's going to be through you walking with the power of the Holy Spirit who goes with you. And so the discernment for you today is to live between the blurry lines of Numbers 9 and Numbers 10. God, help me understand when I am not supposed to go anywhere and the cloud is rested. God, help me understand when you are moving in a direction And I need to follow. And also, God, help me understand when maybe you're trusting me with some of the authority to walk forward, recognizing that you will go with me. And that if I'm going the wrong way, that you will make that clear too. Live in that dynamic. No more of this, all of you and none of me. Of course, our hope is always that we're on the right track with God. But also trust in this space that if you set your eyes on Jesus, that walking just in your everyday life 
will give him the space to infuse all the moments with the sacred and the holy.